Great. Welcome everyone, come to Chapel Hill. And thank you so much for the, all of the panels in the panel one. They give such a great um, reflection and uh, talk about the, um, the, all of the digital, digital curation process and the policies. <coughs> so now we are come to the panel two, and the topic of panel two is about the, the models, standards, and the best practice. And before we started uh, the panel two, just as we did in the panel one, I would like to give just a moment uh, to each the panel to introduce themselves. How about that? With John. Thank you. Uh, my name is Johnson Crabtree. I'm with the Odom Institute here at UNC Chapel Hill, so welcome to Chapel Hill again. Uh, <laughs> glad to have everyone here. Um, I uh, help manage the software infrastructure and the archive uh, at the Odom Institute. <coughs> We're a, a traditional social science archive although uh, we're seeing that change uh, quite rapidly uh, with the more and more different diverse data we're seeing and, and data types are, are rapidly changing and that is, that is some of the stresses on our models and standards uh, as we go. Uh, but uh, we're, we're trying to uh, be diverse and, and work with that and to be very, very flexible with that. So we're seeing a, a big expansion uh, in the social science data types uh, through the last uh, several years. I'm Matthew Farrell, I'm the Digital Records Archivist at Duke University. Um, I work <laughs> predominantly with the University Archives, but also with the other collecting areas of the um, Rubenstein Special Collections Library. Um, <coughs> in the past few years, I've kind of worked solo uh, implementing or developing policy and implementing it, um, but now working with uh, a committee of uh, Rubenstein representatives on a digital records committee to kind of determine uh, standards and best practices going forward so that I don't have the pressure to do it unilaterally. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm Nick Kramhoff, I'm the head of digital preservation at New York Public uh, Library. Um, so that is a position that um, works with collections from our Library for Performing Arts, the Schomburg Center for Black Culture, and the um, Humanities and Social Sciences uh, Library at the Stephen H. Schwarzman Building. Um, and so uh, my position is one uh, that is bringing together um, some of the work coming out of our digital archives department, also our digitization programs, um, and our original documentation programs. Um, hi, my name is Rebecca Russell. Um, I'm an archivist and special collections librarian at Rice University. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> I am one of five archivists in the Woodson Research Center. We do not have a digital archivist, a dedicated digital archivist, um, and nor do we have sort of dedicated curator or info guides, so we do a little bit of everything, um, which includes our digital preservation work. Um, and we are the main university archive <coughs> and special collections for Rice University. Thank you, it's awesome. Thank you for all of the <coughs> introductions. So uh, next I would like to talk about the uh, a little background about um, the, all of the questions we come up for the, the panel two. So actually, um, the part of the questions um, we created here actually are derived uh, from the, all of the partner interviews and all hands uh, meetings in which actually we invited um, all of the partners to uh, to reflect on what they were doing in their um, organizations. And so in this panel, we're really uh, interested to know more about uh, how the organization contacts in the space between the standard and the best practice and the meaningful and the local implementations. And part of the other questions we have in this panel are related to our research goals. So one of the, the really important goals in our project is to increase the number of the organizations preserving <laughs> and curation for unborn digit content. So in this panel, we would like to know actually how the sharing the, the many flavors of the standard and the best of practice implementations can lower the perceived barriers to the entry. So actually that's why we create the three questions for this panel. So before we jump to the, the first of questions, uh, talking about the challenges that using the models and the standard, and the best of practice in your organizations. I would like to actually invite each of the panels to talk about what are these actually uh, the, these models or standards are helpful in your organizations. How about start from John? Sure. Um, we've been at the at the Odom Institute. We've been very fortunate to be able to leverage a long history 
of archive, archiving digital content since the early 60s. We have a good community uh, in the social science community. And we got fabulous people, uh, partners all around the world, quite frankly, that have been working with these models and standards for decades, quite honestly. Uh, uh, for example, people like Mary Varnigan, uh, uh, that uh, I think just retired at uh, CPSR, working with the, the DDI, and uh, obviously Nancy working there as well, Nancy McGovern. So uh, we've had lots of really good people working for many, many years to help adopt, uh, create these standards. Uh, I would say that we would not be in the position we are today without those, uh, especially the metadata standards around uh, DDI uh, initiatives and, and social science. Um, they are uh, quite complex uh, and require lots and lots of effort to maintain and to keep uh, current. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing, we're starting to see changes in file formats. We're starting to see changes in, in diversity of data. So we're having to make those changes along the way. So standards, while it, it seems like you would create a standard and stick to it forever, it doesn't work that way. There's always additions and changes, and then there's challenges along the way, uh, keeping a community in sync uh, with that as well. But um, I, I would say if I had to say one thing about standards, uh, especially around the metadata, is the ability for a standard and metadata to make data shareable and actionable. Just preserving data and putting it in a, a vault somewhere will not help us in the future. You've got to be able to pull it back out and use it. We've got to be able to maintain uh, through a diverse technical change. Things are going to constantly change in the technical world and you're not going to stop that. You've got to prepare for that and these standards will allow you to follow that and make data actionable in the future, as, as well as let people um, discover it and use it uh, even now and into the future. And that's the, the source of funds for archiving those types of data lie in the use cases of it. Because if it's sitting in an archive somewhere where no one can use it, the funding will eventually go away. People will forget about it and the funding will go away. Yeah, I'd say uh, standards and best practices really help with consistency, which is required for what we do, right? This consistency for staff members who expect to see the same types of information about data sets or about sets of materials when they open a folder up. Um, consistency for our users who need to find the same types of metadata about a collection so they can help, you know, across collections find different types of materials that might be useful. Um, but consistency also among staff members who, uh, who might you know, not be familiar with the digital workflow, but so they might ask why you're running a particular scan at this point or why you're doing it in a certain way. And you can point to where the best practices uh, kind of say, like, you need to do it at this point because it creates a paper trail that, that proves X or Y. Um, so I'd say, yeah, the standards and best practices really help with creating a common language for your, your archival colleagues and, and your potential users, as, as well as just enforcing consistency or, or helping enforce consistency across the board. Um, yeah, I would say, uh, that consist consistency uh, really helps out, especially when we start talking um, outside of foreign digital and mixing physical and digital workflows that um, things like these standards and models allow us to really tease out what is actually different in digital, which, you know, it could be a lot, it could be a little, just depending on the kind of material that you're working with. So things like that allow us, um, you know, uh, at NYPL, our processing archivists process the physical and the digital collection. They just move to a different work, uh, workstation in order to uh, do the same, or I mean work with the different material, but they're using the same uh, metadata and descriptive standards to pull that off. And it allows us to shape that workflow a lot more easily. Um, I would agree with what everyone else has already mentioned. I would also say that one thing that certainly helped us at Rice uh, when we were implementing our policies um, is that we had guidelines to, to look to, we had these standards. Uh, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we adapted it to our reality, um, but someone had sort of laid the groundwork and documented it, and then we could look to it um, to see how we could implement it at Rice. Um, we used the NEDCC um, <clears throat> policy template to shape our digital preservation policy, um, and so that was you know, hugely important for us. Great. Thank you. Actually, I think that all of the, the, help, the help of this, you can everybody highlight, highlight here, which will be really beneficial to our project research later. So, oh, okay, let's come to the first questions. So, what's the challenge actually using the models and the 
and the, and the best uh, projects in your organizations. Like you can highlight, highlight some really like uh, important challenges you met in your work or like uh, projects. Well, let's, um, let's start from the <laughs> Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one thing, as I said earlier, is, is adapting the standards to our reality. Um, at Rice, like I said, uh, we're all, uh, we refer to ourselves as generalist specialists. Um, we do a little bit of everything, so we're all constantly trying to work in digital preservation. Um, and so there may be uh, deep pockets of knowledge spread across our, um, our staff members who are, are actively doing digital preservation. And um, so the challenge to know, to keep up with current standards and applying them um, is something that we are, are working into our, our daily, weekly, monthly routine. Um, I think uh, translating across uh, different programs is a very <laughs> tough problem for us to, to crack. So. Um, I personally am an OAS zealot. Um, I model workflows with OAS functions all the time, define information packages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is not something that happens in the day-to-day -day work of a processing archivist or one of our photographers or one of our, um, even our videographers capturing original documentation. And uh, being sure that we're giving enough space in our workflows when we're using these standards to uh, not just use language that is applicable to us, but applicable to other audiences um, is, is a major challenge because we're both doing things the right way, we just can't say it in the same way. Mm -hmm. Say uh, one challenge is balancing kind of the need for machine actionable uh, metadata uh, with um, human readable metadata, right? So currently the transformation of these best practice tool outputs to something that can be used in our descriptive system is a pretty manual process. I know that's been mentioned on maybe every partner call from this project so far, and people want to say it a lot. Um, but that's, it, that's what it is, it's a human parsing that data and translating it to something else. Um, but we're always hoping that this data can be reused by machines, right? So we need the tools to continue to export things in this way that's machine actionable, but it's still also human readable. Um, and then that kind of is compounded by uh, the kind of steep learning curve that these tools have, right? So you don't want to have a, a newer staff member or an older staff member, any staff member, uh, just kind of glaze over when they see this output. So there's kind of a challenge with the, the best practice outputting something that is harder to work with or, or perceived, perceived to be harder to work with. So uh, I, I'd reiterate uh, something that, that our, uh, my colleague from Stanford mentioned earlier about these massive uh, uh, PII uh, false positives. Uh, what we're seeing in the social science world is uh, a, a change from let's de-identify all our data, go through everything and de-identify it. It's, it's common knowledge now that even with de-identified data, with a couple other combinations, you can figure everything out. So now we have to look at it in a bigger, a bigger world. So we're going to have to use things like bulk extractor to go through these things. Unfortunately, what we see are these massive reports that come out that are very burdensome for individuals. And, and, and if you have one of these reports uh, laying on your desk, you feel like you've got to go through it. Right? This is really important stuff. I can't forget this, but I don't have two hours this morning to go through it. So. Uh, that's a real big challenge for us. The, these tools are, are providing great information, but how do we streamline that workflow to make things actually practical in a day-to-day -day operation uh, when you apply them uh, towards uh, real-world issues? And in our case, our legacy archive, we're pretty certain that, that we've cleaned that up. It doesn't have a lot of this, but we've actually run these tools against legacy data that we know is clean, and it still has thousands of these false positives. Quite frankly, in the social science world, we use things that look like social security numbers and data birth all the time in our data sets. I mean, it's pretty common. So it's how do we get around uh, this, this challenge where tools are invented to, to look for things like credit cards, uh, social security numbers. Uh, it's very simple, simplified. Uh, identifiers, but even in our world, that's complex to us. Not to mention the, the really hard things about open and free text. How do you scan through open and free text and look for where someone went to school at or whether they talked about a boss or 
whether they said something inflammatory about their own company that they work for. So those types of things are, are real critical in our world and we haven't solved those problems. Thank you. So um, let's look at the, the second question. So do each of you use the models to create a common language for the department? Or if you don't use it, why? And if you use it, it's just system available. How do you use it? How about, um, who wants to go first with this one? Um, so I, as I said, I love OIS. Um, I'm not going to tell anybody what an ape is or to start telling me their preservation description information or their data objects or things like that because that's just not the, the, the level that they work on. Um, so we, we have to keep that, I've been preferring to keep that translation on another level and to, you know, if this is a workflow to work on the level that, of what's been working because a lot of the workflows at my library have grown up organically and, you know, there are things that need to change. Let's focus on that rather than on, you know, rearranging deck chairs with what we call something. Um, so that's, that's one trick um, with the models. Um, the, the other thing is when we adopt tools that um, might think of models in different ways than, than we do. Um, the one that comes to mind for me is uh, EPAC, which is a really great piece of software um, for those who don't use it. It's uh, email preservation, uh, acquisition, uh, description, and discovery, I think are the, is the acronym. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's an all-in-one uh, system, basically. Like you put in an inbox on one side and somebody works with it to do the acquisition and description and then uh, on the other side you get to a discovery platform. Um, and it's very hard for us to jump in and grab the object that we want to grab and put into our preservation storage. Um, and, it, and it doesn't really match the model that we're thinking of for the rest of our workflows. However, it's the best one that we got. So, you know, we'll adopt it and we'll try and think of like ways to stretch our imagination as to how to fit the model, but um, it, it presents a challenge in that respect. Thank you, Nick. So, how about uh, the Duke? I'd say that we, we do use models to create a common language across departments, although they tend to be kind of one-offs. Or, or it, well, it depends on the, the department, right? I think internally with special collections, we're a lot more communicative than we are with some of the um, the other departments, particularly our IT department, who are building our storage solutions for us and are doing the digitization workflow. Um, so they will they will ask for something and we'll rely on a model to kind of develop that or explain it to them or, or show them what we do. Um, but I don't know how well that is retained over from, from project to project, which is something that, that internally we should be doing a lot better at. So, so how about uh, in the live? Um, I would also, we also use um, OAIS model for our, the basis for our um, packaging and um, <clears throat> we, and, and within our department, that is a common language um, and that is how we move forward in creating our AIPs. Um, with our IT department, they have a very different definition of what an AIP is and we have had conversations um, in which they, um, had, a, I would say, a misunderstanding about what they considered a standard AIP and versus what our standard was. Um, and moving forward on that uh, was complicated. Um, and like Farrell said, they are um, the providers of our storage system, so having those conversations can sometimes be complicated when we have a different understanding of what we need uh, by these information, by these packages. So, so models have been very important in speeding up uh, workflows when you're moving between uh, different data sets or different file formats. But what we've found at Odom is that a lot of it relies on the, the file format. So for example, if you're dealing with quanti quantitative statistical data, those models fit pretty good. You can move around. It doesn't matter whether the numbers in this quantitative statistical data set are are social science survey numbers, or their numbers uh, in public health, or uh, numbers in any other department on campus. So as we see different diverse data sets coming, we can take those models and use them. Uh, one area, and we, we extensively use those, 
is that we have, uh, we're doing more and more in the research data replication. So when someone deposits a, a, a data set and, and a journal article uh, is submitted for uh, acceptance, uh, those journals send us the data, they send us the code, we run uh, a workflow against that to prove that it is reproducible. So the graphs and charts and figures that are in that actual journal match the data and the code that they sent us. We have a workflow for that. It involves archivists, it involves statisticians, and as long as those data formats and data types are similar, <coughs> uh, it's exactly the same workflow. If it becomes more complex and they need a Hadoop file structure, they have a Hadoop file structure and they need a massive uh, 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 non-SQL style database to run the numbers on it, then the workflow doesn't work. That model won't, won't fit anymore. Obviously, if it's qualitative data, it won't fit anymore. So we had to have to tweak and make changes there as well. On our preservation side and the, quanti uh, the quantitative data, if we see a SPSS file or an R file come in, we know that we can create a surrogate uh, in a, an open source R format or an ASCII tab delimited file and store that in our system and that will be readable into the future uh, as far as we know right now. Uh, you always have to revisit those things. But if we got, a, a for example, an in vivo uh, file that has with a lot of qualitative data, that's a different thing. So it's a two different models. So I would say that a lot of this <coughs> modeling really fits well uh, in these curation workflows when the file formats are similar along the way. If they're not, then you have to be able to tweak those. Uh, that's what we've seen over, over the years. Thank you. So regarding the, the, the last question, so where do the current standard and models and the track projects actually um, fall short for the digital curation activities? And uh, so I, I, I don't think this is anything new. Um, we mostly agreed, I think, on steps uh, needed for physical, intellectual, and administrative control over born digital materials. Um, but I think a lot of the, the details uh, are hammered out on an institutional level, and they're highly reliant on an institution's storage infrastructure or their IT security policies. Um, and I don't think that, that those details necessarily translate up to uh, standards, models, and best practices as well as they should. Um, I'd also say there's been work on this uh, second part for a while. Um, but just a lack of consensus around description for born digital content is a real, real need. There has been more development in that area. Thank you. So how about the uh, um, I would say that, as I sort of said earlier, that the, the guidelines are great to sort of shape um, you know, policy, and, but it can be difficult to implement them at the local level. Um, we tend to rely on our local knowledge to, to shape how we approach how we're going to implement these standards um, to fit our reality, which includes you know, staffing shortages, um, our local IT support. Um, so that that is where it can sort of fall short for for us locally. I would imagine across institutions, be similar uh, a reality. So. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say probably two contradictory things, but um, number one, sometimes these standards that we see out in the field are too specific, and then we're fossilized with these problems. Um, one of my favorite ones is if you look into, I forget if it's the EASA or the American one, the standards for audio digitization, and they say, hey, WAVE can only handle four gigabytes, so if you have more than four gigabytes of audio data, Maybe you want to split them, you know, multiple WAV files and put them into a tar package. Or maybe you want to like do all these kind of cockamamie schemes to, to figure out how to ram it into some sort of workflow and still use WAV. Um, and then some people invented RF64, and that's okay, but it's not the standard. And so if your vendors start giving you RF64, you know, we start getting flags from our QC department and said, oh, we can't take this. This is not a WAV as we conceive of a WAV. Um, and then we've gone a little bit further and we said, well, what if we want to just jump off the wave bandwagon? What if we want to go into black? That's an entirely different thing. And, and now we, we are you know, having a political debate both internally and externally with the field to say, well, what will it take to, to push forward on this standard? Because everybody knows wave is the best, even though it's a, what, 30-year-old, 25-year-old format, something like that. So you know, 
we've done, we've done better since then. Um, the other part is uh, when implementations are not specific enough. Um, so you know, you read workflows about digitization, things like that. Um, but then some of the things that happen when you start changing context of a, of a workflow. So you know, when we were digitizing in a small scale, uh, the current network bandwidth was okay. But you know, when the scale that we're digitizing at now, well, all of a sudden we have to do network bandwidth upgrades all around. So. You know, it just wasn't scaling up the, the staffing costs and the, uh, the, the uh, kind of uh, digitization costs. It was capital costs that we had to pay into things to, to actually make our workflow continue to uh, progress at the level that the institution wanted it to. And, and I, I think it's this diversity we're seeing, this change, this rapid change in, in uh, technology that's straining some of these models. Uh, they were they were built based upon uh, a standards several standards that lasted a long time, but now we're seeing those change. So we got to be dynamic, got to be diverse, uh, especially in the area of sensitive information. Uh, I mean, we've spent uh, well, I, I've only I've spent 25 years doing this, but I've spent over 25 years trying to detail metadata as much as I can, put it. it you know, machine readable, go in there and grab all the variables, get every single piece of information I could out of this data and get it into the metadata. Now, this metadata might contain sensitive information. Now we gotta start restricting parts of this metadata. So it, it's balancing these two things. I wanna create all of this, but now I might have to restrict some of it, even at, even at the metadata level, not to mention the file level restrictions. So it's balancing that change as we enter this world where uh, file formats are changing, uh, multidisciplinary data is a reality now. We literally store social science style surveys along with DNA materials uh, and, and combining these mixed mode methods uh, across the health sciences uh, with the folks in the social science. So data science is, is grabbing all data putting it together and making great uh, things forward, but how do we protect our human subjects along the way? And I think the models are being strained by the two sides. One, we want to share everything, we want to describe everything. The other is we want to protect our human subjects. So that's really uh, a strain on the models. Thank you. So actually, um, um, in this panel, we are talking about um, uh, a lot of actually challenges regarding the uh, the model standards and the best approaches. Mm -hmm. So now I should I would like to give each uh, the panelists uh, um, a couple of minutes just to try to highlight the the most important challenge actually you have already met in your um, in your work and then you really want to actually uh, get this solved so actually you can instantly improve your your whole like uh, the workflow or your or change your work life even. So uh, what if kind of like challenges actually you, you really want, like for example, our research team to help you to, to address? How about that, you want to see? So um, I, we, we've mentioned this already before. Uh, we use Bulk Extractor in order to look at all our data sets. We automate this process. <laughs> IRODs actually, uh, we use a tool called, some middleware called IRODs to manage our data and make replications in uh, different places around the country. But during that process, Bulk Extractor is, is launched and we analyze that data. Well, I want to catch that replication process before it happens so we don't replicate sensitive data around the country, right? But if we're getting all these false positives and we can't go through these data in, a, in the right amount of time frame, we just can't do that. So we're having to hold back on some of the analyzing some of this Bulk Extractor data because if we can't physically review it fast enough, before Amazon takes it and puts it in three different places around the country. Uh, and people make mistakes. We've, we've had mistakes through the years where uh, a researcher says, yes, I know I clicked the button that said I took all the, the sensitive data out, but I uploaded the wrong file. And it was the next day. Well, guess what? My preservation network done its duty. It's done pushed it out. Now I gotta go around and pull it back out. And depending on what kind of preservation network you have, is if it's locked, it makes it even harder, right? So we have a challenge there that we need to catch it in a timely fashion. The tools are almost there, but we need to do a little more work to push it over the edge so we can make these things happen 
uh, in, a, in a rapid enough to where these technologies and preservation networks can use them in real time. Thank you. Yeah, I would add to that. That's great. Um, I would add to that, uh, um, touching on what I mentioned earlier, which, which is uh, the human readability piece of it. Right now, a human is having to look at something and copy and paste or reheat information. So making the, the tools really feed into one another uh, would be the biggest challenge that I would like to do. But failing that, like I know where to look in these files, but figuring out what to tell additional staff member where to look, what you know, to not feel overwhelmed by the amount of metadata that's being generated and then where exactly to look for the types of description that we're looking for would be, uh, you know, not, not a perfect solution, but kind of the next step at least. Hmm. Um, I'm having a hard time thinking specifically in terms of a tool. Um, the, the, thing, the thing when I look at our workflows that I really question is uh, we're generating all this uh, metadata, this DFXML, these METS files, all these things, honestly, like, what is, what is the use of so much of it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 there's lots of great things for, you know, preservation purposes, for provenance purposes, things like that, but, like, in terms of access purposes, I, you hear all kinds of anecdotes of, like, hey, they delivered the files to me, and there's this extra gunk in the folders, like, is, what is this XML, like, can I get rid of it somehow? Um, and so trying to understand like a better, a better understanding of what the users want um, and how they can filter back and impact our workflows. That goes to you know, issues like our, you know, can we start using RF64 and FLAC question because I think our users don't want to have two WAV files that they have to figure out the order of and, and things like that. Um, but it also goes to questions of just, um, Okay, well that's a deeper issue, but just digital literacy of our users and like what do they actually want? What are the things that we need to do? Because right now it feels like we're trying to do everything for everyone and that um, is stretching us, I would say. Um, I'd say at, at Rice, we have a very manual um, AIP creation, extremely hands-on. Uh, we provide a lot of contextual information that is hand-keyed in by our folks. Um, and something that Nick said made me think about that, that all the meta metadata that we capture from these tools, we don't have a way to sort of automate the, the you know, populate our fields with that information. And um, that we would love, we would, it would be wonderful to have a way to automate that process because we have a very slow process to create the AI piece of create. And also, I don't know if that's necessarily what the end user wants. It's what we want, we think we want, um, with all the different provenance and preservation and access restrictions, but I don't know if our end users necessarily want what we are capturing versus what we're not capturing. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for actually this wonderful, like the, the four panelists share all of the, the challenges they met in the, their work. I believe actually all of this, like um, their experience and the, the, these challenges or the pain points they identified in this panel will be super helpful for our research team to improve the, the whole system, like improve uh, development. We, we are trying our best actually to, to address this uh, issue so that we can actually build <coughs> a lot of partners across different uh, institutions. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your past training and thank you.